Good morning. We're so glad to see you here on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're so thankful that you've chosen to come and worship our great God together as family. And we're excited you're here. If you're a guest, join us. We are so thrilled to have you come and spend your time with us this morning worshiping our great God. We would like to get to know you and connect with you. So we have something we call Connect Cards. There's some out in the little table in the foyer. There's some over in the Welcome Center, which is right through that door. And take a right down the stairs, and you're in it. And if you'll just take a moment at the end of the service to fill that out, we greatly appreciate that. It's just our way we can be in touch with you. But if you have a prayer need, please put that on there. We count it a great privilege to pray for you. And if you have any questions about the church, put that on there as well. And you can turn that in at the end of the service. There'll be someone there at the desk in the Welcome Center. We've got a free gift we'd like to give you just to show our appreciation for you being here this morning. And if you're joining us online, we would just want to say welcome to you as well. We're glad that you can join us online. A lot of people can't be here. There's a lot of sickness going around. So we have several of our folks that are homesick uh, this week. And so they're watching online and other folks in other places that can't physically be here watching online. So we're glad to have them join us in worship today as well. Well, as we begin, I want to read a passage of scripture from Psalms 122, verse 1, and I want you to ask yourself, is this my heart getting ready for worship this morning? I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Did you come with a glad heart this morning to worship our great God? I realize we've had busy weeks, so we know we had community revival this week, and several of us did the roof project at Life Choices this weekend, and so it's been a busy week for a lot of folks, a lot of things going on. But if you just stop and think who God is, that should bring gladness to your heart. It should bring joy to your heart. But stop and think also what he's done for you personally, especially through his son, Jesus Christ, who died to pay the penalty for your sins so you could have everlasting. And we come to worship, we ought to come with gladness. We ought to come with great joy simply because of who God is, but also what he's done for us. And that ought to be reflected in our worship this morning. So think about that as we worship this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we are grateful and thankful for who you are and the impact you've had on our life, all of our life, Lord. And we come this morning with gladness of heart. And if we don't have gladness of heart, I pray we get right there real quick. Because when we stop and think simply who you are, it should bring great joy to our lives. We should be filled with gladness because you are our creator. You are the giver of life. You are the sustainer of life. You are the giver of everlasting life through a relationship through your son. And every day we see your grace and mercy and love poured out in our life. And we are grateful and thankful for that. So Father, as we enter this time of worship together as family, may we truly worship you in spirit and truth. May we come before you with clean hands and a pure heart. And may our gladness of heart just be overflowed in what we're about to sing as we just worship you and study your word and apply it to our lives as we worship through giving. And Father, as we worship, as we leave here and go to our small groups in Sunday school, Father, and just have a time of worship with the smaller group, Lord, as well. But also throughout this week, may it be reflected in our worship individually as well. And we pray you're honored and glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' wonderful, life-changing, saving name. Amen. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out. This, this morning we're going to sing this. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, and we, it is sweet, and I hope you are trusting in him. If you're not, I hope you are before you leave. So let us get the words up. Need them back here. There you go. Let us stand. <clears throat> Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the sake of Yes, I'm sick as I'm 
number of couples that have celebrated anniversaries this week and we just want to congratulate them and praise God for them. And the first one is we want to say congratulations to Robbie and Carson Yow. They celebrated their third wedding anniversary on Tuesday. Let's celebrate with them and praise the Lord. And then also on Tuesday, Joey and Heather Glenn celebrated their 14th wedding anniversary. So let's praise the Lord for them and celebrate with them. And then yesterday, Jeff and Donna Wright celebrated their 23rd wedding anniversary. So praise the Lord for them. Amen. And then also yesterday, Jamie and Ingla Gilly celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. So let's just praise the Lord for them as well. So we are thankful for these couples and uh, the, the impact that God has had on their lives and this, that we can celebrate their wedding anniversaries and just what God is doing and pray God's continued blessing upon them. Well, I just want to praise God for a great community revival. It was good to get together with our sister churches and fellowship and worship together and just be together. We had a great community revival and we saw God bless. And uh, thank you for generosity and giving towards the Mercy Chaplains. You gave about $2,500 uh, to, to uh, support the Mercy Chaplains and Ralph said thank you for that. He's very appreciative, and they're very appreciative as you continue to support the Mercy Chaplains, and I do want to encourage you to pray, continue to pray for them, and uh, they have a great ministry reaching our first responders and those that are going through tragedy and heartache in their life. So we just uh, praise the Lord for this week of community revival. I also want to praise the Lord for good weather for our roof project at Life Choices, uh, and everybody stayed safe. We got a bunch of sore folks this morning, but, uh, but uh, we are thankful that God kept us all safe, and I thank you to everyone who came out and helped. We had, you know, a number of different folks, a lot of folks from uh, Red Mountain that came out and helped mainly, um, some other churches that came out, but uh, we, I thank you for the folks from here that came out and helped. We greatly appreciate your help. And so just praise the Lord for answering our prayer for good weather. And uh, we're going to finish, the, we didn't finish the roof. We didn't have quite the help we were hoping for from other churches. And so uh, we're going to finish it next Friday. So if you can help out next Friday, we're going to meet there at eight o'clock and hopefully we can finish it next Friday. So pray for safety once again and pray for good weather weather as well next Friday. And so thank you for, for helping out with that. And if you would continue praying for Lumpy Compton, you probably saw the email this week that Lumpy is back in the hospital. He's had a terrible flare up with Crohn's disease. This is probably the worst he's had. And so he is doing better. Talked with Sheila yesterday evening. He, he's still in the hospital. They're trying to get him squared away and get him kind of leveled out. He is better than he was Thursday when he went in. But, but we just want to continue praying for Lumpy. They've had a rough few years with his Crohn's disease and is constantly in the hospital. And so so uh, remember the, the whole family in your prayers, if you would. And then let's pray for Rodney Laughing House. Rodney is continuing to have a little bit of chest pains in the evening. And so they're going to do a stress test this Tuesday to see if they can figure out what's going on. The hope is to treat this with medication. And uh, so we just pray they're able to do that. But just uh, pray for Rodney and Dorinda. Pray for the doctors as they do this test so they can figure out what's causing those chest pains and that they can take care of this with medication. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful. Uh, for who you are. And we just come and just worship you and praise you simply because you are Almighty God. And Lord, we are thankful that we can bring our requests to you and you hear our prayers and you answer our prayers, not according to our time frame, not according to our wishes and desires, but according to yours, because your timing is perfect. Your will is perfect, Father. And we give you praise that you do hear us and you do answer us. 
Father, I thank you for these couples that we can celebrate their anniversaries with them that have celebrated multiple couples with multiple years of marriage, Father, and the blessing uh, they are to us, but we just pray you continue to bless them in the years of marriage, and they just continue to reflect uh, Christ in their marriages, Father. And Father, we just, uh, we just want to praise you for community revival as well. We just thank you for the opportunity to get together our sister churches and spend time together and catch up and to see folks we don't see all that often, but sometimes we see throughout the community, but just to worship together and to fellowship together and bring honor and glory to you. We thank you for moving in our midst. We thank you for the decisions that were made. And Father, I thank you for the generosity of your people to give about $2,500 to the emergency chaplains. And we pray your continued blessing be upon the emergency chaplains as they minister to our first responders. And they're there alongside going in and helping them as they're in the midst of tragedy and, and heartache and ministering to the victims of, of this tragedy and heartache, Father. And Father, we thank you for keeping us safe this Friday and Saturday as we were on the roof of Life Choices. And I thank you for the ones here at Red Mountain that came out and worked so hard, Father, and the, and the few from the other churches as well, Lord. And I just praise you for good weather. I thank you for cloud coverage for most of the days. And, and Father, I just uh, thank you that we got uh, what we did done. And I know we still got some more to finish up. And so I just pray for the same thing this Friday. As we go back to finish, Father, I pray that you give us good weather. I pray that you just keep us safe as well. And we're able to finish the task and bring out the workers, Father. And thank you that we can partner with Life Choice as it seeks to help uh, those that are, that are pregnant, Father. These young women that are pregnant. And Father, considering whether they're going to keep the baby or not and helping them make that decision to keep the baby. Baby, but also to help them when the baby comes and provide parenting support as well. And Father, we just continue praying for Lumpy. We pray you put your healing hand upon him. I thank you that he's doing better than he did was Thursday when he went to the hospital. And Father, it seems like this is his worst flare-up of his Crohn's disease yet. And so we pray that there's no more like this, Father. But I just pray that you just uh, bring healing to his body, that you ease this, this inflammation he's having, Father, and give the doctors wisdom and guidance uh, to treat him so he can come on home. And Lord, we just pray for Rodney as he goes in for this stress test too, so they can figure out what's going on, so they can treat this with medication and take care of these chest pains he's having in the evening, Lord. And we just pray that you just put your healing hand upon him and just continue to touch him, Lord. I know they've given him no limitations. I know he worked hard this weekend. And Father, I just pray you continue to watch over and protect him and give him and Dorinda and Megan the peace that surpasses all understanding, Father. And we just pray you take care of him. And Lord, as we continue in this time of worship, Lord, we just pray that you are honored and glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1. Last Sunday, we began a series of messages in 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, and uh, we'll be in here for some time. Uh, it's a whole lot longer than the book of James, if you go and see. Um, we're going to take a break uh, for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and then come back to it, and so, uh, and so uh, we're picking up where we left off last week. Uh, we did the first nine verses, and we're picking up in verse 10 today. Uh, years ago, it was said that when British, the British and the French were fighting in Canada back in the 1750s, that Admiral Phipps, the commander of the British fleet, was told to go and anchor outside of Quebec. Quebec. Uh, he was given orders to wait there for the British land forces to catch up as they, as they were getting ready to take the city. When they were going to take the city, there, he was to support them with artillery and, and, and kind of lay the groundwork for them coming into the city. Well, uh, Admiral Phipps' Navy arrived early, and, and while they waited for the ground forces to catch up to where they were, he kind of got annoyed as he looked on the shore and he saw this one cathedral that had this tower with all these statues of these different saints on there. And he didn't like that a bit. And, and those, so, those sa statues of the saints began to annoy him, so he told his, his sailors to take the cannons and to open up fire and to take out those saints on the tower. Now, well, no one knows how many rounds were fired. Nobody knows how many statues were actually knocked out. But when the land forces arrived to take the city, and the signal was given to attack, the admiral could not help at all because he had used all his ammunition shooting at the saints. You know, the sad reality is, is that's how it is in a lot of churches across America today. 
that there are Christians shooting at the saints in the churches, shooting at each other. Last week we saw how we are called saints if we know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Too many Christians are attacking each other and they're fighting and they're, and they're bringing division to the church uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week as we began this, Paul began kind of on a gentler note because he talked about to the Corinthians who are Christians there and who they were in Christ and what that all entailed in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But now he kind of just dives right into the problems of the church because the church was facing multiple problems. You know, it's never pleasant to have to deal with problems in our lives, but Paul deals with them right up front. He doesn't hold back any punches. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He just deals with the problems. And so right here at the beginning of his letter, he comes to grips with these problems that these Corinthian Christians are facing in the church, the things that they're doing. If you stop and think about it, all churches deal with problems in one of three ways. One way that churches deal with problems is they kind of ignore it. They just kind of sweep it on the rug and they just hope it's going to go away. We know that's never going to happen. It's just going to fester and it's going to get worse. Another way that churches deal with problems is they deal with it in an unbiblical way. They just kind of deal with it. They let their flesh rise up, and they, and they deal with it the way that the world would deal with it instead of dealing it with it the way the Word of God deals with it. And that's the third way that, that churches deal with it is they deal with problems openly, honestly, and biblically so they can deal with that problem, so they can move on past that problem, and they can continue serving for God's glory. And really, that's the way that we all should be dealing with problems when we have problems in the church. I mean, the church, think about it, the church is not some kind of a trophy case where you put perfect saints on display. The church, really, if you think about it, is a training ground for immature saints like ourselves to become more Christ-like. So we mature in our faith, and we're going to encounter problems along the way. And that's why we need to be encouraged to deal with them biblically. And the church is not some playground where spoiled Christians always get their way. There's a lot of churches out there where you see spoiled Christians always seeking to get their, their way. If you think about it, the church really is a battleground. The church is a battleground because we battle against our flesh. We battle against the evil that's out in the world. We battle against Satan himself. But when you do it God's way, we experience some wonderful victories through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the church in Corinth was full of all sorts of problems. I mean, the church was, had Christians, had saints that were fussing, they were fighting. They had, they had ones that were living immorally. They had leaders that were fighting and, and even debating about spiritual gifts. In short, the Corinthian church was being torn apart. There was division that was happening in the Corinthian church, and, Spa, and Paul seeks to deal with these problems directly. He seeks to root out the cause of all these problems. So let's pick up where we left off last time. If you're physically able, stay with me in honor of reading God's holy word. And let's look at verse 10 there. He writes this, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been de declared to me according to you, uh, excuse me, declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by, these, uh, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or if I am of Paulus, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanos. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Father, this morning as we dive into the problems in the Corinthian church, open our eyes to see if there's any of that going on in our lives. And Father, if there is, let us deal with it biblically. Let's, let's not deal with it unbiblically. Let's not deal with it by sweeping it under the carpet, hoping it's going to go away. But let's deal with it like Paul does, head it. Head, head it off up front and deal with it the way that you call us to deal with it. But Father, if we don't see these problems, we give you praise, but let us guard against these problems so they don't arise in the future and we don't know how to deal with them. So speak to our hearts and challenge us, convict us if need be, and I pray that you just empower me to preach your word, Holy Spirit. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, division is taking place in the Corinthian church, and Paul is dealing with division in the church. And that's what we're looking at today. You can see the title of the message is dealing with division in the church. So Paul begins this section, and he's very frank about the danger of a church that's divided. In verse 11, he writes this. He says, it has been declared to me. 
And he's chosen his words very carefully here because he wants to make it clear. He says, look, I'm not just gossiping here. I'm not just repeating gossip here. He's dealing with something that has been unquestionably true. It's, it's been reported to him, and it's openly known by everybody. It's, well, it's a well-known problem in the church, but sad to say it's a well-known problem in the community as well. We endanger our witness when we allow division to happen in the church. It doesn't just happen, to, it doesn't just happen in the church, but it spreads out in the community well, as well. And that's what was happening here in the church of Corinth. So as we look at the idea of dealing with division in the church, there's three truths that I want us to look at this morning. As we look at this passage of Scripture, here's what I want us to ask ourselves. Am I causing division in the church? And here's the other question I want you to ask. Am I striving to prevent division in the church? So three truths I want to share with you as we think about those thoughts this morning. The first thing I want you to see is I want you to notice the reasons for division. Let's go back to verse 10 and look at the first couple of verses there and talk about the reasons for division. Look again what he says. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And there will be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. These Christians were living in a city that was known for factions. These Christians are living in a city that was known where there were splits among family. There were splits among businesses. And what had happened is what happened in the city, what happened out in the community, was now carrying on into the church. And now the church was having divisions. It was having splits. It was having factions taking place. And Paul uses two words in these verses to show us what's involved in the problem of division in the church. The first word I want to point out to you is down there in verse 11. It says, there are contentions among you. Let's stop and think about that for a moment. Contentions are always the first step towards division in the body of Christ. Here's what Paul is basically saying. He said, look, there's fights among you. There's strife among you. You're fussing with each other. And and you're bringing division to the entire body of Christ. You know, it's interesting to notice that that, that there's a similar word in the Greek. And we, we translate it sometimes as the word strife. And I want to give you another passage of Scripture where this word is used and kind of show you the idea that goes along with this word strife. Over in Romans chapter 1, verse 29, Paul uses this word strife as well. And it's found right in the middle of a list of words. The the word before it is murder, and then there's strife, and the word after it is deceit. And what that list is, it's a long list of characteristics that Paul gives that he's describing the unsaved person. In that list, he's saying, here's how someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior behaves. So he's saying someone who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior is a person that does have strife in their life, that does have contentions in their life. I mean, think about it. It's significant that Paul is is saying that, look, this fussing and fighting, you're acting like you don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior is what he's saying. The word contentions is also found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. In those verses, Paul gives a list of the works of the flesh. He's talking about the believer, but he's talking about how sometimes we can go back to our flesh and let our flesh rule our lives. And that that list there uses the word contentions as well. Contentions is, is listed there as one of those works that comes up when we let our flesh rise up and we let our flesh take domina- domination in our lives. And if we do that, if we're living by the flesh, guess what's going to happen inevitably? We're going to have strife. We're going to have contentions. We're going to be fussing and fighting for our own way. When the problem of contention and strife come up among God's people, if you stop and think about it, they come from one of two sources. They come from people in the church who've never been born again. That's one source they come from. They don't know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And like that first list I mentioned in Romans, is they're just acting like a lost person. And in every church across this land, there are people who don't know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. You say, how do you know that? Well, more than likely that's the case. There may be some who's not, but, but that's how it should be. We should have people in our midst who don't know Jesus, the Lord and Savior, so we can encourage them to come to know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. So that could be one source. Now the other source is this is this contention, this strife comes from Christians who are living by the flesh. Christians who are living what Paul may call carnally. They, they're immature in their faith. They haven't grown like they should in their faith. Or maybe they've gotten out of proper fellowship with God, and now they're living by their flesh instead of living by the Spirit. They're allowing the works of the flesh to take prominence in their life. And so now they're going to fuss and they're going to fight for what they think 
is important, what's important to them. And that's why we have contentions in churches across this land, because we have believers who are either immature in their faith or they're not in fellowship with God because they're dealing with unconfessed sin in their life. And they're just watching out for their desires instead of watching out for what God wants. This is what's happening in the church in Corinth. Some of these new believers were having contentions among themselves, and they're arguing about, you know, what, what down in verse 12 it talks about. They were taking sides. There's basically four different groups they were following. You know, you know I'm going to follow this person. I'm going to follow that person. I'm going to follow this group. You know, the Corinthian Christians were fighting about personalities, who they thought was most important. You know, one of the real signs of spiritual immaturity and carnality among Christians is they argue about personalities and they seek to follow a personality instead of being loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, let's just be honest, preachers are different. I hope you realize that. You know, when Pastor Cameron stands up here and preaches, it's different than when I preach. And that's okay because that's the way God made him and God made me different. But the sad reality is, is a lot of people across this land, they will follow a preacher instead of following the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be more loyal to a preacher than they will to the Lord Jesus Christ. I share with you how, how you know, I watched that documentary on Hillsong Church out of New York City, Hillsong, New York, and how that church became, and really it, that church is, is really dwindled down, if, I don't even know if it's still in existence or not, but that church became a church that they elevated their pastor, Carl Lentz. And they were more devoted to Carl Lentz than they were to the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at where that church is today. The doors may be shut today. And this was a huge church with thousands of people coming. See what happens when you follow a personality instead of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's a music leader or some other leader in the church. You know, we all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. But the one we're supposed to be following is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we follow someone besides Jesus, that's where we have contentions and strife. You know, one of the marks of a mature Christian is that we can recognize that God has gifted all of us with different gifts. And God puts us in the body of Christ to use those gifts so that we can serve others, so we can serve our community, so we can bring honor and glory to God, so we can help people grow and mature in their faith. So yes, not everybody's going to be the same. We're not a bunch of, you know, just cut out carbon copies of the same person. God didn't create us that way. God created you unique. God has given you, given you gifts to use in the body of Christ. And, I'm, and let me hear me on this. Don't follow me. You follow Jesus. Don't follow Pastor Cameron. You follow Jesus. And you fill in the blank of whoever you may be following. Because you know what? I'm imperfect. And I'm going to let you down. I'm going to mess up at times. And I'm going to disappoint you. Don't put me on the pedestal. Put Jesus on the pedestal. He's the one that needs to be followed. That's the problem of the Corinthian church is they're putting Paul on the pedestal or they're putting Apollos on the pedestal. You know? I mean, I, I mentioned there's two words here that are causing division in the church. One is that contention because people are fussing and fighting and they're following different people. But the second word, I want you to go back, ten, back to verse 10 to see the second word here. The second word is the word divisions. And the word divisions in verse 10, it means to tear a garment in two. The unity of God's church at Corinth had been torn apart by selfishness. It had been torn in two by fighting in the church. And there's two basic reasons for division in the church. Sometimes division in the church comes because of the members themselves. They become so busy and what in their own way. They become so busy because they're jealous of other people and they're talking and they're argumentative and they're, and they're fussing and fighting over things that don't matter. Churches will fuss and fight and split over things that have no eternal significance whatsoever. And that's how the enemy wants us to be. And divisions are created in the church. Another reason for divisions in the church is described in a passage of scriptures in John chapter 7, verse 43. Listen to what it says. So there is a division among the people because of him. John is talking there in John chapter 3, verse 43. John is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in that passage. So here's what we're getting across here. Sometimes when the word of God is preached, it exposes, it reveals hidden divisions in the church that are already there. Let me, let me give you kind of this example. Suppose you go home tonight and you hear something crawling around in your attic. You know? You're not going to call, don't call 911 if you hear something crawling around the attic. It's not probably a burger, it's probably a mouse or something like that. But let's just say you hear it all night long. So you call the exterminator the next morning. 
The exterminator comes, they go up in the attic, and they take pictures. You've got rats up there. They come down, they show you the pictures. You know, you've got rats up there. Here's the pictures. What if that homeowner got mad at the exterminator? And the, and, and the homeowner, you know, says, how dare you say I've got rats in my house? How dare you show me pictures of rats in my house? Why, why would you say there's rats in my house? And then they got so mad they punched the exterminator in the face. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It's not the exterminator's fault that those rats are there, is it? He's just pointing out the problem. That's what happens sometimes when preaching and teaching of God's Word takes place. You know, the, the same principle applies to when God's Word is shared in the church of God, of God, when it's shared among God's people. You see, when sin and wrong priorities and wrong motives are revealed by God's Word, division can result in the church if we don't repent. You can encounter God's word. You can encounter the Lord Jesus Christ and, 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 they can, and God can point out something in your life. And if you don't deal with that, that sinful thing, that wrong idea, that wrong motive, and you just become more hard-hearted, guess what's going to happen in the church? You're going to become more divided. Because we're not going to be united by the Spirit because we're not living by the Spirit. We need to repent of those things when God's word points out those things in our life. Now looking at their lives, looking at, excuse me, looking at our lives this morning, Here's what I want us to do. Ask the question. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't think of somebody else. This is just you. Am I causing contentions? Am I causing divisions in the body of Christ? If we are going to properly deal with division in the church, we have to address the reason behind the division. And so if we're causing those contentions, if we're causing that division, now is the time to repent. Because if we don't repent... It's just going to get worse. If we don't repent, it's going to cause great harm to the church. And it's going to cause great harm to the community as well. Because the community hears what's happening in the church. Maybe you're not causing contentions. Maybe you're not causing divisions in the church. So what do we need to do then? We need to guard our lives so we don't cause them in the future. This is why it's so vitally important that we stay in the Word of God. That we let God's Word get in our life and change us and grow us to be more Christ-like. This is what, that's why it's so vitally important that we become people of prayer so we are in tune with God, so we are in tune with the Spirit and asking God to point out things in our lives that aren't right, asking God to point out our selfishness, asking God to point out the things where we live by the flesh so we can repent and we can get right with God. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit so when he does convict us, we can deal with that. Because if we don't deal with those things, like I pointed out earlier, when the Word of God's preached, we don't deal with them, guess what's going to happen? We're going to get more hard-hearted in our living. And more divisions can take place. More contentions can take place. So as we continue dealing with the idea of dealing with divisions in the church, there's a second truth I want us to look at this morning. I want you to notice the terrible picture division displays. Notice the terrible picture that division displays. Look again at verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Notice that first phrase there in verse 13, is Christ divided? That word divided there is not the same word of divisions that's used in verse 10. The word divided here in verse 13, it literally means to cut to pieces. Here, here's the idea. When someone in the Old Testament would take it and just slaughter an animal, when they would slaughter that animal and they would cut that animal into pieces. So when we allow division, when we allow contention to come within the fellowship of the church, we are displaying a picture to the world of a Christ that's divided. Get the image here. A Christ that is mutilated. A Christ that is cut to pieces. What Paul is saying is that when there's division in the church, it's like we're cutting Christ to pieces to the community around us. That's the picture that we're displaying. And let me just tell you, friend, that's a terrible picture for a church to be displaying to the community. Paul's making two points here. First, he says that we are cutting the cross of Christ to pieces by our divisions. Look again at verse 13. He asks that question. Was Paul crucified for you? He's trying to get the Corinthians to, to see the cross of Christ once again. I mean, the, the cross of Christ is so central to our faith. As a matter of fact, over the next chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says this, For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. You see how important the cross is? When we remember the cross, our hearts should be stirred. Our hearts should be moved in what Jesus Christ has done for us, that we want to live like he's called us to live. You know, the Bible uses many words to talk about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the words that it uses is the word slain. 
Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, Revelation tells us. Jesus was slain on the cross of Christ. I mean, think about it. The hands of wicked men took the Lord Jesus Christ and they cut his back to pieces with a whip as they whipped his body. They took a crown of thorns and they pressed that crown of thorns upon his head and blood ran down his face. They took nails. And they, and they pierced his hands, and they cut his hands to pieces, if you will, with those nails. They took that spear, and they sliced his side, cutting him to pieces. So here's what Paul is saying here. Is it once enough? Will you still crucify the Lord Jesus Christ afresh and anew today? Will you still put him to open shame is what he's asking. When he's asking, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? When a church allows itself to be divided, it's mutilating the cross of Christ. It's giving a distorted picture of the cross of Christ to the community around us. Now in the last part of verse 13, Paul asks the Corinthians, you know, if the Corinthians were baptized in his own name. He says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now he's not minimizing baptism here. He's not getting that. What he's trying to do is simply trying to get people to focus not on the person who baptized them, but the one in whose name they were baptized, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to say to them, when Christians allow divisions to come into the fellowship of the church, they're mutilating the cause of Christ here. You see, think about the cause that Paul had when he went to, to Corinth. What was his purpose there? His purpose was to win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he established this New Testament church there for the purpose of reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the cause of Christ. But the Corinthian church lost the sight of its purpose because they were so divided. You know, that's a great problem for churches today. They get so divided over non-essential issues, over secondary issues. They get so devoted to choosing sides, and they lose focus of their purpose of reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing what Christians will fuss and fight over today that don't amount to anything in the long run. Christians argue about non-essentials. And when they do, they're mutilating the cross of Christ. They're mutilating the cause of Christ. And they're reflecting their own spiritual immaturity. That's the image that they're displaying to the church. I mean, to the community around them. I wonder how many people will go to hell in a community because Christians display a divided, mutilated Lord Jesus Christ in their community. Division in the church truly does display this terrible picture to its community. Here's the question I want us to ask, our family to ask. What picture are we displaying to our community? What picture of Jesus are we displaying to our community by how we live our lives together as family? Are we truly showing Jesus who he is, the, the Son of God, the Lord and Savior, the one who can give us everlasting life, the one who can give us joy, the one who can give us hope? Or are we showing a Jesus that has been cut to pieces by the church? It's a terrible picture to think about. But too many churches are displaying the wrong picture of Jesus to their community. That's why it's so important that we do everything we can to protect the church from division. So how do we do that? That leads to the third truth I want you to see this morning. Notice the plea for unity here that Paul gives. We're going back to verse 10 again. Look what he says. He says, now I plead with you. You see, that's intense there. He's pleading with us. Brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, that you but, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. As we, as we go back to the beginning of verse 10 here, we see that Paul is talking about division within the church in the context of unity here. Notice that Paul uses that word brethren twice. He uses it once in verse 10 and once in verse 11. I mean, Paul, is, his heart is filled with love. For these Christians. Now his statements may be seem, seem hard at times. His statement may seem stern at times. But it doesn't mean he doesn't love them. He loves his fellow believers there in Corinth. He's just trying to get them to understand these particular problems and how to correct these problems in the church. And so he writes here, be perfectly joined together. Here, picture the, you know, let's say someone who broke their bone. It's the idea of resetting that bone back into place. This same idea is found when Paul wrote this in Galatians 6.1. He says, Brethren, if a man has overtaken any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one. Paul is making a plea here for restoration. That if this is taking place, restoration is happening. If this is taking place, 
We need to strive to bring unity back to the church. We need to deal with this problem in the church. In order for the church to be unified, it must, be under, it must understand how central Jesus Christ is. Look what he writes here. He says, now I pay with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus on the throne, not you, not me. Jesus always has to be central. Paul talks about Jesus. He mentions Jesus ten times in the first ten verses of chapter one here. The church becomes divided when Jesus is no longer central to the church, when something else takes priority. Paul knew the solution for the divided church was to put Jesus back on the throne once again, to make Jesus central once again. When Christians let let his name become preeminent once again, let his voice be heard, let his will be done, you know what's going to happen? We're all concerned about Jesus and what his desire is. We will become united. Look at your own life this morning. Do you need to put Jesus back on the throne once again? Kick yourself off or somebody else off and put Jesus back. You know, once the church understands how important it is to have Jesus as a center, then we can support the idea of church unity. Because we're going to be coming together. He, he uses the word same several times there. He says, speak the same things. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Church unity comes when God's people are thinking and speaking the same way. You say, how is that possible? We're all different people. You already said we're unique. We're individuals. That's why it's so important to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We can be united by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can do such a work in our heart. The Holy Spirit can do such a work in our lives that he brings us to the same conclusion. He brings us in the same direction, that we are saying the same thing, that we are doing the same thing, because this is what God desires for us. I've shared with you in the past how when we shut down for COVID back in 2020, how your church leaders, the pastors, and the deacons got together on a regular basis. Sometimes weekly, sometimes every other week. And we prayed for God's direction. We prayed, God, this is all so foreign to us. What is it that you want us to do? We're not going to wait for the government to tell us to open. We want to do what you want us to do, God. And we agreed that we would not do anything. We would not step forward until we all came back united in the Spirit to do what God wants us to do. And that's how things happened. And God has blessed because of it. When we are united by the Spirit, God bless us. We need to strive to be united by the Spirit. Years ago, there was a college football player. Uh, He was a terrific player. But like a lot of sports athletes, he became very prideful. He became very arrogant. And he realized how terrific he was. And he thought that he was so good that he didn't need those those 10 other players out there on the field with him, that he could do it all himself. And so when he started thinking that he could do it all himself, that he didn't need a team, the team thought they would show him a lesson. I mean, teach him a lesson. And they they thought that, well, all right, you think you can do it by yourself? Let's see how you do. So when the next play was called, one guy kind of stepped to the side, let the linebacker come through. The center stepped to the side, let his guy come through. And all of a sudden, that one player got hit by 11 guys on the other team. You see, when the team stopped being unified, everything collapsed. That's how it is with the church. The same principle applies to God's people who don't support unity in the church. When we realize our lack of support, the unity of the Spirit can change us. It can correct things. We need to be begging of God to make us united if we're not united. Like the psalmist prayed in 80, Psalms 86, 11, he says, Unite my heart to fear your name. He was praying for unity with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was praying for unity there. We need to be praying for unity that we are united in the Spirit. You've heard me say this many times, and I'm not just saying it because I'm the pastor. It's all what God has done. I am thankful for the family of Red Mountain Baptist Church. I am thankful for the unity we do have here. Don't think I'm preaching this this message because I think there's great division in this church. Don't think I'm preaching this message because I think there's contention taking place. I don't. I'm not saying there might be some things off on the side that I'm not aware of. There may be something. I don't know. But I believe overall we have a sweet unity here that a lot of churches never experience. And I'm thankful. I'm preaching this message because it's next in line in chapter 1. And I'm being obedient to preach the whole counsel of God's word. So don't sit back and think, well, Dave, you just said it. Don't apply to me. I'm good. No. 
We need to guard against this. We need to strive to keep the unity that God has blessed us with. Because Satan will do everything he can in order to stop what God is doing here at Red Mountain to bring division to the family. What are you doing to protect the unity that we have? You say, what I need to do, what I've already told you, stay in the Word. You've got to be in the Word. Now, look, I'm thankful that you're here on Sunday. I'm thankful that you come to Sunday school. I'm thankful you come to worship. We come together as a family, and we worship God. I praise God for that. But one day a week is not enough to be in the Word of God. It's the old example of what if I just ate one day a week? That's not healthy. If you just feast on God's Word one day a week, it is not spiritually healthy for you, and you will allow contentions and division to come into your life because you're not on guard. We get on guard by being people of the word, by being people of prayer and asking God, like the psalmist prayed in 8611, God, bring unity to my life with my brothers and sisters in this church, in this family, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So when we do step out of line, when we are living by the flesh, we're doing something that, that is out of sight of God's will, that the Holy Spirit convicts us and immediately we confess and we get right with God. And we deal with that sin in our life that we allow to come in our life by giving in temptation so that we're not out of fellowship with God. This is how we protect the unity by guarding our individual lives. And we seek to be people of prayer, praying together for God's will to be done. If you were there Wednesday night, I preached on God's will. Step through the door. There's a lot of Christians across this land that close the door in God's face and never want to step through it. When we gave our life to Jesus Christ, he purchased us with his blood. I no longer belong to Dave Pryor. I belong to Jesus. And he has called me to live by his will. But if I'm not sensitive to the Spirit, if I'm not in the Word of God, if I'm not a person of prayer, I will never know what his will is, and neither will you. But here's the cool thing. When we're all doing it together, the same spirit that's in you, that's in me, that's in you and everyone else that knows Jesus, he brings us together. And he leads us all in the same direction. And God blesses in a mighty way. That's why we need to guard and protect and strive to maintain the unity that God has blessed us with. How are you striving to do that? Well, maybe... What you need to do this morning is make sure there's no contentions in your life. There's no divisions in your life. And if there is, the Holy Spirit convicts you of that. You need to repent this morning. That's what needs to happen. Maybe you feel divided from the body of Christ because you're not a part of the body of Christ. And what needs to take place in your life is you need to ask God to forgive your sins and come to your life and save you because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. He died for your sins across the cross of Calvary like we mentioned earlier. And he was buried, rose again the third day to give you forgiveness of sins, to give you everlasting life, and to make you his child. And you do that by accepting that free gift. Maybe that's what needs to happen in your life this morning. Friend, we are in the midst of a battle. And we have to be on guard. A battle of spiritual warfare that's only going to get worse until Jesus comes again. And we can't just coast through the rest of our life. We can't just get in the lazy river and just take it wherever it goes. Because you know where it's going to take you? Away from God. And it's going to bring division to the church. So I'm asking you today to make a commitment. Will you strive to protect the unity of God at Red Mountain Baptist Church? God has blessed us in phenomenal ways. And it's all to his glory. It's not anything I've done. It's not anything Pastor Cameron's done. It's not anything you've done. It's what God has done. And he gets all the glory for it. But if we're not careful, we can easily get off track. And we can lose it all. Because the enemy wants to bring division. Father, thank you for warnings like this in your word. Lord, I'm thankful that Red Mountain is not a church that is fussing and fighting and tearing each other apart and we're not perfect we're far from it but father i am truly thankful for the spirit of unity that is here father <coughs> for the family that we truly are 
because of our bond in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're reminded, we're warned about what was going on in the church of Corinth, that the enemy does not want that. He wants division in the church. So we need to deal with that biblically. Father, if there is division in our life, that we're divided from the church because we're a contentious person, we're bringing divisions, and we're seeking to tear things apart because we want it our way. Holy Spirit, convict us right now that it's not about us. It's about you, Jesus. And that we'll repent of that. Father, I pray that each of us, as God's children, that know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today we will make a commitment to preserve and protect what you're doing here. Father, that you will continue to bless and move in a mighty way that only we can give credit to you for of what you've done as we seek to do our part, to be in the Word, to be people of the Spirit, to be people of prayer, and be sensitive to leading the Holy Spirit, that we are united and moving forward to do your will. And that we will do everything we can to protect and guard the unity we have. Father, protect us from the attacks of the enemy. Father, protect us from division in your church. And Father, for anyone here, anyone watching online that is divided from the church because they don't know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that today they'll come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we've been presented with many things that we could do. We could respond to this message. And you're dealing with each of us individually through your spirit. And I pray we are obedient. For some, that means they want to come and down and talk with me and pray with me. Maybe some want to join the church. Maybe some need to be baptized. Maybe some need to become a Christian. And I'll be glad here to talk with them. I'll be down here at the front. For others, maybe they need to get right. They need to repent because they are a contentious person. They're bringing division. Father, for the ones that are not, they just want to commit. Maybe right there in the pew or maybe right here on the altar and just humbly get before you and ask of you, Lord, help us to maintain the unity and guard it and protect us from the divisions of the enemy. But let us do it individually as well by being people of the word and prayer and sensitive to the spirit. Father, whatever is leading us, you're leading us to do in this time, may we be obedient to that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, you respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you this morning. I just want to say thank you to our guests that are joining us, remind you about those connect cards. They're out in the foyer. They're also in the Welcome Center. Take a moment to fill those out. Take you to the desk over there in the Welcome Center. we got a free gift to show appreciation. We're so thankful that you've chosen to spend your morning with us and worship our great God. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm thankful for everyone who helped with the Life Choices Project. you, you got to be proud of your folks. They worked so hard. 
And, uh, but we're not done. And so if you could help out in any way, next Friday we're going to meet over there at 8 o'clock. We've got, we did one side, tore it off, put it back, tore off the other side, put about half of the shingles back, and two smaller roofs in the front of the back of the building to do. So we're going to hopefully finish that up next Friday. So if you can help out in any way, join us next Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning. I also want to make you aware at the beginning of this month, the Beacon newsletter is going to be sent from a different email account. Some of y'all receive it. A lot of y'all receive it through email. So if you didn't see it in your uh, inbox folder, check your spam folder. Um, from now on, it's going to be coming from beacon at redmountainbaptist.com. So I just want to make you aware of that. Because I know some people said they didn't get it. Uh, we've changed up how we're sending it out. So I just want to make you aware of that. And then ladies, I want to invite you out to this Tuesday is your women's Bible study. I always have a great time of, of studying God's Word and fellowship and prayer. It's going to be in the Family Life Center at 645, continuing the study, Jesus and Me. So if you haven't been before, ladies, I do want to encourage you to come and be a part of that wonderful study. Next Sunday, we're having parent-child dedication. This is a time where we set aside the parents and the children just to dedicate them to the Lord, that we're going to raise our children in, in God's will and for God's purpose, and, and uh, we're going to raise them in a Christian home. And uh, oftentimes we have young, young parents who want to do that to their newly born children or if they haven't done that before to their young children. If you want to be a part of that, I just need to know by this Wednesday so we can prepare for that. I know we already have one family that's going to do it. And so if we have some more, I, I need to know that by this Wednesday. So let me know by this Wednesday. If you're here today, let me know today. That would be better so I can get better prepared for that. So, um, and then if you're going on the trip to Kentucky to the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, um, they're going to have a meeting next Sunday after the 11 o'clock service. Just a final meeting to finalize all the details as y'all get ready to head out that week. And so just want to make you aware of that. As Pastor Cameron's been sharing, uh, we're selling quarts of stew. This is the time of year where we do our annual stew fundraiser for missions. It's going to be on Saturday, October the 14th. And there's still a few ingredients on one pot left. You filled up all the other pots by donating ingredients. Thank you for doing that or sign up to donate them. So there's still a few ingredients that we need help with. If you can help out with that, you can sign up in the Welcome Center. If you haven't signed up to purchase stew, they're $8 a quart. That's also out there in the Welcome Center. And so I want to pre say, say thank you for helping out with that. That's always a great fundraiser for missions. And then our next Men of Iron Bible Study Men is October the 16th. And so we had a great Bible study this last time. Had 19 men come. I thank the Lord for that. And so uh, it would be a great problem to outgrow that classroom after moving to the Family Life Center. And so I uh, want to invite our men to come. So that's October 16th, 7 o'clock. So we want to encourage you to come. And then ladies also during that time. The women are going to be praying here in the sanctuary. And ladies, thank you for praying. I think we had four ladies come out last month and pray for us men as we're having that Bible study and pray for other things. So I want to invite our ladies at the same time that the men are meeting on October 16th at 7 o'clock. The ladies are going to meet in here uh, for prayer. And then the Fun, Fun Bunch annual mountain trip is Tuesday, October the 17th. If you'd like to go on that, you can sign up in the Welcome Center. They always have a great time going to the mountains and spending the day together. And then I also want to go ahead and give you another date for your next trips. The Southern Supreme Fruitcake Factory is going to be November the 14th. And the sign sheet isn't out there for that, but it will be soon. So I just want to go and give you the date for that. And then finally, uh, for our children, for kindergarten through fifth grade, you're invited to our Kids Ministry Fall Fun Day. It's going to be on the 22nd of this month. You're going to head out and do a corn maze and have a hayride, the pumpkin patch, all the fall fun stuff to do. And that's going to be after the 11 o'clock service. Lunch is going to be provided, but they need to know who's coming. So if you're planning on coming or your kids plan on coming, sign them up. That sign up sheet is also in the Welcome Center. So if you have any questions about that, you can see the members of our children's ministry team. Well, it's been great to worship you this morning. I want to encourage you to head on to Sunday school and just get together in your small groups and have a great time of Bible study and fellowship. Let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful and thankful for your love for us. And Father, we are thankful for what you have done for us every day of our life. And Lord, as we dismiss now and go our separate ways, many to Bible study, Father, I pray we'll go displaying the right picture of Jesus to this community around us, Father. The people will look at our lives and they'll see you, Jesus. We'll, they'll see Jesus in the way we behave. They'll hear Jesus in our words. And we'll have a chance to share you with the community around us. And we ask this in your name. Amen.